How can you tell which one's the original? This episode is sponsored by Frontend Masters. Engineers have watched over 2 million hours of Frontend Masters videos to upgrade their skills in the latest best practices in frontend development and Node.js. Popular video courses of theirs include courses on Advanced JavaScript, Angular 2, React, API Design with Node, and Functional and Asynchronous JavaScript. Many of their teachers have even been guests on JavaScript Jabber. Check them out at frontendmasters.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 238 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have Jameson Dance. Hello, friends. Amy Knight. Hello. AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live, like always. And Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. And this week, we have a special guest, and that's Bob. Did you say it was Zeidman? Zeidman, yeah. Hello, everybody out there. Do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Sure, sure. So I'm Bob Zeidman. Uh, I... Uh, one of the main things I do is I do consulting, engineering consulting. I'm an engineer. Engineering consulting on intellectual property litigation. So patents, copyrights, trade secrets. When there's a fight going on between two companies, they'll hire my team and myself to take stuff apart, reverse engineer it, write it up, compare it to patents, copyrights, determine whether trade secrets exist and decide who is infringing on whom or who stole somebody else's code. I've also developed some specialized tools to help with that analysis. And uh, I also have a, another company that uh, does automatic software generation for embedded systems, particularly the Internet of Things. And the big focus there these days has been security, uh, especially after the attack that occurred uh, last week, I think it was, or a week ago Friday, where a whole bunch of systems came down and... Uh, the understanding is that a virus, a bot, got into a bunch of IoT devices and then started doing a DDoS attack on uh, one of the uh, web hostings. I guess the, the DNS server, a big DNS server. So anyway, that's a summary of some of the stuff I do. So are you an attorney or do you work with attorneys? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Every It's always the second question I get. In fact, it's good you ask because some people just assume I'm an attorney, but I know I probably know more attorneys than anyone ever should, but I'm an engineer, but I've written about intellectual property. I actually, I think I can honestly say that I know more about software intellectual property than the vast majority of attorneys do. So the thing that I find really interesting is that there's all this uh, information out there about forensics and, you know, tracking, tracking down all of, uh, you know, all of the things you talked about doing. Uh, I'm curious, is it, I don't know, it seems like it would be a little bit hard to figure out who's doing what on the internet or who's doing what in software? So, yes and no. It's What frustrated me when I first started doing this kind of work is companies would sue each other about copying. And literally one of the first cases I was involved with, they had two professors from the University of Stockholm one was a computer science department, was a computer science professor, and the other was the computer science department head. And they basically each wrote a report that said, I looked over the code and I have 30 years experience and this looks like it was copied to me because nobody would write it this way if it wasn't copied. And then the other expert would say, uh, well, I've got 40 years experience and it doesn't look copied. And the judge <laughs> and the jury would have to say, well, which guy, which of these guys seems smarter to me? And what I did is I actually created tools. I created a measure of software correlation, and I wrote about it. And I created a tool. Uh, it, it actually came out of some work I was doing on the side. This was never meant to be a company or a product, but it just caught on. But it was a way of measuring software. And you still need a human to review the results. But what you can do is you can focus on the stuff that looks like it might have been copied, and then a human can look at it and determine if it really was copied or not. Interesting. So how can you tell if something's been copied? So it's a good question because what I told you right now is really just part of the equation. I actually offer training online and people get confused. And I wrote an article just earlier this year about it. So what you should do is you should, you run the tools and the tools will say, here's a bunch of stuff that looks copied. But then you really need to have some human judgment and the, and the human judgment involves what are the chances that these two sections of code uh, just happen to be the same? And uh, 
so for example, I had a colleague of mine, very smart guy, took the training. And after he spent 40 hours on the final exam, and he finally came to me. And it's, it's not supposed to be that, not supposed to take that much time. But he said, I just can't determine who copied from whom. And I said, okay, look at these, you see these four lines of code in both programs? And he said, yeah. I said, what are the chances that they would have the same four lines of code and that there wouldn't be any difference? The, the, the variable names were the same, the constant names were the same. But he said, but it's only four lines of code. I said, okay, but it could have happened by chance, but it's pretty small, right? He said, yeah. I said, okay, now, what are the chances that they're all in the same sequence? Because they could be in any sequence and it would still work. And that two people happen to write the same code in the same sequence. He said, well, it's pretty small, but it's not zero. I said, okay. And then look at this comment here. Other than one word, the comments are exactly the same, right? He said, yeah. And I said, so it could happen, but it's pretty small. And he said, yeah. So then I said, uh, uh, so when you look at all these things together, what are the chances that all these things happen? There's, there's a tiny, tiny chance that it happened by coincidence, but that's not a reasonable uh, assumption. And so when you go to court, you have to say what's reasonable and what's not. And, uh, you know, unless the stars align in a certain way, that wasn't going to happen. So the the conclusion is that it was copied. So I've got a question about that because, I mean, I've, I've copied four lines of code from something before. And a lot of times it's a very simple algorithm where it's like, well, yeah, I could change the variable names. I could re put it in alphabetical order, but it's it, usually those kind of snippets are the things where, you know, you're copying from Stack Overflow or something. It's it's like it's a simple one way to do something. Yeah, so that's a good question. And I think it's a it's a problem these days because people don't understand, and even computer science professors don't understand what the line is, what the limit is. So if you're copying from a third-party source, first of all, an open source, uh, you know, if it's open source code, then you typically don't have to worry about that. You might have to worry about the open source license, and that's a different issue. And and if both parties copied from the same open source code or third party code, we actually have ways of eliminating that. And so we say that's not copied, in the sense that it's not it's not illegal copying. Again, there might be license issues that whether that whether you were allowed to copy that code or whether you have to make the whole source code public, but Part of the problem is, let's say you work for a company and then you go start your own company. This is pretty common. And you decide, you know, I wrote this little sorting algorithm that nobody cares about, but I wrote it by my last company and it's only 10 lines of code, so I'm going to copy it. The problem is that's not technically legal. What is legal is if you say, oh, I remember, well, there's other issues, but let's say from copyright law, you can say, I remember that I had this great sorting routine, and so I'll just rewrite it, it's only 10 lines of code, it's really worth it to rewrite it from scratch. Um, now, copyright is only, copyright infringement is only copyright infringement if it's substantial. But the problem with software is that almost anything is considered substantial because it performs a function. You know, if you're talking about a novel, like uh, you want to borrow a line from Romy, let's say from Hamlet, if you, if you borrow the line, he walked into the room, nobody's going to care that nobody reads Hamlet because it has the line, he walked into a room. But if you copy to be or not to be, that is the question. Well, then, then Shakespeare could sue you because that's substantial. The problem is, and recognize... Thank goodness he's dead. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is with software, since it all represents a function it's easy to show that you were doing something substantial because instead of taking a month to write it, you only took a day by copying it. Uh, and you didn't have to debug it. You didn't have to integrate it with the rest of the code. So, you know, people, it becomes a gray area that I recommend not, not taking the chance. Yeah, but what about, so I, I almost became an attorney, you know, one of those uh, poor people that hate their jobs. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, and I was looking into going into uh, intellectual property and, and patent law. And one of the other areas is trade secrets. So what if that 10-line sorting algorithm is kind of the secret sauce of your previous employer? Isn't that also protected? Yeah, actually, that's a great question because I hesitated when I was saying, uh, when I was explaining, and then I specifically said copyright. So that that 
Well, the thing is, anything can be a trade secret. I mean, almost anything. And, and any company can declare almost anything as a trade secret. Doesn't mean it is, but I've seen lots of companies claim really weird stuff as trade secrets. So if you, if you rewrote the sorting algorithm from scratch, but the previous company could sue you and say, that's our trade secret. But the nice thing is, the good thing for you is they have to show that one, they tried to keep it secret. So they never told anybody about it. They, they didn't publish it anywhere. They didn't share it with any customers. They have to show that it's, and they also have to show it's valuable. And that's the harder part to do. They would have to show that people bought their program because of the sorting routine. Now, if they go to court, that's really hard to show for something like a sorting routine, unless it's a sorting program. Let's say they sell a, a library. Oracle. What's that? Or if you're Oracle. Right. Okay. So uh, I, for full disclosure, I worked for Oracle in the Oracle Google case. Um, just to let you know. Oh, but, the bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, but with the trade secret, the good part for you is that they have it's their burden to show that they kept it secret and that it was valuable to them. So it's it would for most for most companies, it'd be hard to show that a sorting algorithm people bought their program because it had a great sorting algorithm. So you'd be in the clear. But that doesn't mean they wouldn't sue you. That's the problem is that when you do stuff like this, you could get sued and then you've got to fight it. So you mentioned you worked for Oracle on the Google Oracle case. Are, are you able to talk about that at all? Or does that get into uh, dubious legal territory? I, I, I ask because I feel like almost everything I've read has been kind of from the um, Oracle is evil. Google is right. They're defending freedom perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it could be interesting to hear the Oracle perspective from, uh, but but not from Oracle, I guess, if that makes sense. So let uh, I can probably talk a lot about it because I I was supposed to testify, but my part of the case, uh, Google agreed that they weren't going to fight it because what I did was was hard for them to challenge, and in the end, it didn't matter that much. And, and so I I can talk to you about it if we get to anything that's sensitive. I'll tell you. But let me start out by saying that I have a philosophy that I will work for any party that hires me. I don't prejudge who's right or who's wrong, uh, but sometimes clients don't hear the information they want to hear, and so I don't work on that case very long. Uh, so given that, that didn't happen with Oracle. I, I have some strong feelings about Oracle. I actually think that Oracle was in the right, and I can tell you some of can, why. Can, you, can you give great. us a summary for what just... I know this is a very complex issue, but some people might be like, Google, Oracle, what is he even talking about? Sure. So you know that Oracle bought Sun. Sun invented Java. And Sun licensed Java libraries. So the, the Java language is free. But if you're using the libraries for commercial purposes, then you had to pay a license fee. If you're using it for non-commercial purposes, it was free, and the language is free. So people sometimes confuse the language. It, the lines get really blurry. Even when I was brought onto the case, there were all these discussions about what's the library, what's the language. That was part of the controversy, too. But if you use the libraries, you have to pay for them. So like the standard libraries, like file, I.O. type of stuff? You know, I think, so I'm, I'm going to tell you what I recall. There were some libraries that ended up not being an issue because they were free. So file IO, I think, might have been free, but some of the others were not free. And Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So I think things that were absolutely necessary to write a simple program were generally free. Generally, I don't want to, I'm not 100% certain, but... More complicated functions like sorting routines were not free. And Google knew that they were not free. And at trial, there was a lot of emails that came up that basically people at Google said, Google tried to negotiate a license with Sun and they couldn't reach an agreement where Google would pay Sun for the libraries in order to create Android. So they wanted to create Android and they wanted to use the Java libraries. 
So they couldn't reach an agreement. And there were emails from high-level executives at Google that said, well, we can't do it without a license. And other people said, let's do it anyway. And people were saying, no, we can't do that. Other people said, yeah, we can. And so they decided to do it. Uh, So that's one of the things you don't hear so much. So at Google, at least a number of people knew they were doing something they weren't supposed to. And they had tried to do it the right way. So what they did is they created their own libraries and they wrote, they kept all the APIs. So people talk about the APIs because what happened was they rewrote the code that implemented the APIs. So if you want a sorting algorithm, I don't know, bubble sort, they still called it bubble sort. They, they still had the same parameters with the same data types in the same order in a lot of cases and it returned the same value. But they implemented the code completely differently. In my opinion, the reason they did this, they basically rewrote the code. Why not rewrite the APIs too? And then there would have been no trouble at all. So the reason they didn't is basically Java was one of the, had one of the largest users, number of users of any programming language in the world. And they didn't want to retrain people to use Android. So the advantage Google got is they leveraged all the years and all the marketing that Sun had done, and Sun was later bought by Oracle, so that people could say, knew exactly how all the APIs worked and didn't, they didn't have to teach anybody anything new. And in my opinion, that's where the problem was. They, they took advantage of the years that Sun had spent educating people. And so when it went to court, you know, here, here's something that people don't know. When it went to court, the first time, the jury said that APIs are copyrightable. And by the way, it wasn't just a few APIs we're talking about. Uh, I think it was 11,000 APIs that were identical or virtually identical in both Android and Java. So of those 11 or 12,000, the jury actually said it's copyrightable, but maybe Google had a fair use. So the law says that if you can show that it's for the public good, and there's a bunch of criteria about what that means specifically, but if you can show it's for the public good to copy something, then you can copy it, even though it's copyrightable. And typically that applies to like educational purposes. If, if you want to teach Java in school, you can copy anything you want as long as you're using it to teach students. So the jury in the, in the case said that the APIs were copyrightable because they were creative, because you could have done it a whole bunch of different ways. And, and Google decided to do it exactly the same way in most cases as Oracle did. But it might have been fair use. They weren't sure. But the judge overturned their decision and said APIs are not copyrightable. Interesting thing was Oracle then appealed that to a higher court. And if you read the decision, which, is, which I'm glad to send you or you can find it online, The higher court, which I think, I believe was a panel of three judges, if I'm not mistaken, they came down on the first judge really hard. And they said, you basically got everything wrong about copyright. They said there might be a fair use, but there's no question at all that the law specifically says that lines of code are copying and are copyrightable. APIs are lines of code, which means unless it's fair use, you're not allowed to copy it. So everybody's... Okay, so far, following any questions at this point? Well, I, 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 I have some opinions about that, but it, it's like, okay, so let's say that I create a function that has a signature of three items, and I rename them from I, N, and X to J, M, and Y. So it's so. Here's the question: If you actually did rename them, then yeah, it's copying. If you thought of it on your own and you came up with different names then it's not copying. And so I've written, I've written a textbook about this stuff and I've defined something you've probably heard of called a clean room. So a clean room makes sure that if something looks similar, it's, it's not, it wasn't copied, it just looks similar. And if Google really had wanted to avoid this question altogether, they could have set up a clean room where they redeveloped everything on their own well, it was agreed between the two parties that they re- that they redeveloped all the what they called implementing code, all the code underneath the APIs. But it was Google admitted that we just copied the APIs. 
they said, we copied them because we want people to use them. And we think that's okay. So basically, it's not like they came up with the same kind of thing. They specifically said we copied them. So it went back to the first judge for a new case, for a new trial. And the second trial was not whether it was copyrightable, but whether it was fair use. And here's the problem I have with, with Google's argument here. They basically said, so many people are using this that it's for the public good that they continue to use it that we've got millions of people developing for Android. And therefore, what we did was an advantage to the public. To me, that's the equivalent of saying, I stole your television, but I set it up in the neighborhood so everybody could watch it so it's not theft. And But they won on that argument. And it's undergoing appeal, but I've read at least one law professor's paper and he said, fair use is such a gray area that it's really hard to overturn any fair use arguments. So most likely Google is going to have won this on their fair use argument. Let's pause for a moment to talk about our sponsor, Taurus. Taurus is a new tool for managing and securing the secret information that allows your app to run. You know the stuff, passwords, API keys, database credentials, all the stuff that gives access to the private stuff that you don't want anybody to touch except for your application in specific ways. Taurus provides a convenient way to store all this information in the cloud, and they can't access it because it's encrypted with material derived from your password, which is never transmitted to their server. So it's secured from them, from everybody else, but accessible to you. This means only the servers, development machines, and applications you've allowed can access the information. So make secrets management headaches a thing of the past and check out Taurus today. You can find them at devchat.tv slash Taurus. That's devchat.tv slash T-O-R-U-S. So that's so Google and Oracle. And I think it's really interesting, you know, the, the nuances here. Am I likely to run into a scenario like this? I mean, not exactly like this, but where I may take somebody's code and, you know, they, they may have an issue with me copying their API or something like that. So I think, I think potentially it could, but if you're making under $10 billion a year, probably, uh, you know, Oracle's not going to care. Uh, part of it though, again, is I think if you look at why Google didn't change the things that they copied, that they admitted to copying. They didn't change it because they wanted to leverage what Sun had been doing for years. And I think that's the big issue. If you copy an API but change it around, then uh, I think it's harder for anybody to make an argument that it harmed them or that you were leveraging somebody's efforts. It, technically, it may not be allowable, but probably nobody's going to come after you. And, and if they did, the other thing you've got to think about is damages. In most cases, copying someone's U APIs, even if you're, if it's found to be true that you copied them, very few programs are purchased because of their APIs. But Java is one of the programs that people, that they, that, that Oracle, I think, made a great argument that because Google's, Google said, we want people to know how to use this. They actually, there was an email that came out that said, we don't, we can't afford to take the time to train everybody in new APIs. We've got to use something that everybody knows already. And in my opinion, that should have really turned the case against Google. That one email should have done it, but it didn't. So, this, oh, go ahead. I, I just don't know if that makes sense. I mean, the thing is, it's the, it was the economic value. Most of the time, if you copy APIs, there's not a whole lot of economic value in it. Uh, so from a practical point of view, you might be doing something wrong. It might be, you might be able to call it fair use. My advice is, is don't copy, you, you know, you can look at an API. Actually, copyright law says, it's very clear that you can reverse engineer things. You can study them. You can learn how they work. You can learn what their efficiencies are and why they work. That's the whole point. You just can't copy it. So if you set up a clean room, which isn't that difficult, you can have one person study something, write up everything about it and then hand it through an uninterested, unbiased third party to hand it to another developer and say, uh, here, develop this on your own. And they won't, the second developer won't know what the code originally looked like if it's done correctly, but they'll know exactly why it worked, what its advantages were, what the optimizations were, 
Uh, and that's perfectly legal. And Google could have done that. It's not like they didn't have the money to set up a clean room. That, uh, I don't know. That sounds like something out of a Kafka novel that that's like the solution <laughs> to this problem because it, it's, it's the same thing in my head. Like I, I get how there's a legal distinction between them, but I don't understand how that legal distinction makes the world a better place. Um, so in, in my opinion, what it does is there was, the, there was a case years ago called, uh, well, there was, uh, Nintendo v. Atari was a big case. And uh, Atari wanted to make game cartridges for the Nintendo game machine. This was in the 70s. And Nintendo had a copyright. And they said, if you want to make a game for our machine, you have to pay us. And so they had a really tight control. And they didn't allow the freedom of expression for people to make their own games. And Atari reverse engineered Nintendo's game console, figured out what the interface was like, and then gave that to some programmers and said, here, make a cartridge that uses this interface. And that was perfectly legal because they didn't copy anything. The problem was, but let me, before, before anybody says anything, Atari made some really stupid mistakes. If they had stopped there, they would have been okay. And the whole point was the judge said, we want to encourage people to copy, but we want them to do it in a way that they're they're copying ideas, not actual code. And they said, we want people to learn from other people's ideas, but we won't, don't want to, them to literally copy what they've done. The problem is Atari actually ended up copying some of the code. They just got lazy and they said, hey, let's just take this piece of code here and use it. And it killed the case for them. Plus, they did some other things that were just kind of gray that the judge didn't like. So ruled against Atari. But the whole idea of copying ideas and concepts uh, – is okay. And, and I should add to that, it's okay if you learned it independently. If, if you worked at the company and learned it, then it's not okay. But if you reverse engineer something, reverse engineering is perfectly okay. So is, is that what patents oh, go ahead. protect against then? Is that I, I essentially engineered a way to do a specific thing. And so I have a patent on that. And then even if somebody else does reverse engineer it, if they reverse engineer it and figure out how to do it in the same way I did, then that's covered by the patent and they can't copy me. Yeah, so that's exactly true. But that's why patents have a limited lifetime. People can argue about right. whether the lifetime's too long or too short. But, but one perspective there is, so if you want to copy how something functions, the only way to do it is with a patent. Well, you can do it with a trade secret, but you know what? If somebody else figures it out, and they didn't steal it from you, then they can do it if you don't have a patent, right? So if you figure out this great new machine for, uh, you know, I don't know, a, a new way of lighting, you know, turning electricity into light, and you don't tell anybody, and somebody else happens to figure it out, there's nothing you can do. But if you've got a patent, then for up to 20 years, nobody can do it, even if they didn't do anything wrong. They just also figured it out. Now, one thing that people don't, think about is before we had patents, uh, when people invented something, they would keep it absolutely secret. They'd fight over it. If it was important enough, there'd be wars over great inventions. And then as soon as the inventors died, nobody knew how to create it anymore. So eventually, I think uh, I'd say like, I think in the 1600s, maybe I could have the date wrong, but I think it was the 1600s when people start governments. Well, it actually goes back beyond that, but technically patents themselves were, I think around the 1600s where, uh, basically the government would say, okay, since people are dying with their inventions and we're not making much progress, if you tell everybody how it works, we will enforce it. Nobody can copy it for a certain amount of time. And, and I think if you look at economics, uh, Invention and innovation really took off off after the that period of time when when government started protecting inventions like that. So if we're going to talk about patents, then software patents. And I, I, I hear the collective groans of our listeners, right? <laughs> you hear about these patent trolls, right? Uh, or in podcasting, there was a patent troll for podcasts uh, where they said they had invented podcasts. And we've seen three or four of those. So, you know, what... What's the deal there? I mean, what is there to patent about software? So I think, I personally think there's a lot to patent. I agree that 
So I let me say, I think there's a lot of bad patents uh, and I've seen them when we do work for companies. Yeah, you know, I'll give you an example. This is a terrible example, but I was once flown to Southern California and met up with a professor and a company had hired us to assert some patents against some big companies. And he and I spent the entire day looking at these patents and you know, we're hired by the client. We want to do the best job we can for the client. But at the end of the day, we said, all of this stuff has been invented before. This was actually a hardware patent, but there's a lot of software patents like this. We said, all of this stuff has been invented before. We've got documentation on it. We can't, you, know, you can interpret patents because it's not always clear what they mean. So you can find an interpretation. And we tried to find an interpretation that was valid and we couldn't do it. And at the end of the day, said we said, we just can't do it. And they thanked us and they paid us. And I didn't hear from the company until about four years later when I read that they had successfully sued some very large hardware companies. <laughs> so that's unfortunate because I think they had bad patents and they found someone who was willing to support them. And they went to court and the jury or judge didn't understand, probably the jury didn't understand the technology. And maybe the expert that they found looked really smart. And they want a judgment. So I've actually spent my career trying to stop that kind of thing. So having said that there's a lot of bad patents, I still think there's a lot of good software patents. And I think that the solution to the problem is to fix the patent office, which doesn't do a good job of understanding what the invention is. And it'll allow bad patents for stuff that everybody's been doing for years. And it'll also disallow patents for really unique uh, things that are being done that the patent office just doesn't understand. Yeah, I remember actually, I, I had an internship when I was in college and was writing patent applications. And the amount of research that goes into those and things like that um, is pretty kind of crazy. And then, yeah, I mean, if they come up with a new or novel way of doing something, then I... I definitely agree. I mean, they should be able to um, profit by it for a certain amount of time, but by <laughs> revealing it, yeah, we get the kind of advancement that you talked about where the state of the art is moved ahead because even though I can't do whatever it is that the patent covers, I can look at it and go ahead to the next thing or the next few things because now I understand that principle uh, behind the invention. And yeah, anyway, um, it, it's really fascinating to me when we see this in software. And, you know, I, I know that you can also patent business processes. So you, you can get a patent for that. You can get a patent for um, software algorithms and things like that. And the actual code's covered by copyright. But, uh, yeah, so how do, you, how do you look at something and say... Um, because a lot, I mean, nobody's going to go and look through the U.S. Patent Trademark Office and say, okay, um, I'm looking to make sure that there's no patent for this thing before I do it. They're probably just going to do it, especially in software. And then you see somebody come along and actually sue them. And in some cases, as you said, the patent's, you know, solid and the, the, the case is solid and sometimes the patent's not solid. But, but how do you look at that case and go, okay, um, you know, this, this is wrong and I'm going to stand up to it. Or how do some of these companies actually decide, you know what, this isn't a good patent, but we don't actually have the resources to fight it? Yeah, I, I think it's a good question. I don't, I don't exactly have a solution for it. I do know that somebody bringing a case... Oh, so, so, so the term patent troll is, is thrown out a lot. And, and I have a story I can tell at some point about that. But part of the problem with that is that it's used to... It's applied to any company that has patents that, that somebody doesn't like. And so all these companies get mixed together. Some companies do bad stuff with their patents. The, the companies I really don't like, although I think the solution is simple, the companies that, like, for example, the, okay, I, I don't want to say the podcast necessarily haven't looked into it, but it's the kind of thing where a company goes and says and sues thousands of people for $1,000 each saying you're infringing on our patent. That's just a way of intimidating people into paying. And I think everyone I know agrees that that's bad and should be stopped. Yeah. So the companies that really sue 
the companies that will, well, companies that try to license patents, they always try to license. The thing is, most big companies don't want to license. They basically say, we're not going to pay you unless you sue us. That's not always the case, but the lawsuits usually start out as a negotiation. So when there's a negotiation between big companies and one's got a patent and maybe it's an NPE, doesn't practice anything, you know, I don't like the term patent troll because it starts out with an assumption that they're doing something bad. Uh, but let's say they, they try to license it, the big company says no. If the patent's no good, most of those companies will stop because it can cost them $10 million to sue somebody. And even if it's a great patent, at $10 million, you've got a chance of losing, and you lose your $10 million. So I think suing someone over patent infringement is not as easy as some people think it is. Um, when you're suing, you know, when you're, you've really got a strong patent, um, but, but, you know, it's this hard calculation that I don't know what the solution is. You certainly get, the thing is you get big companies. So l let me give you an example. I, I worked years ago, I worked in a very small industry that was probably about a $30 million industry. And the key player in the industry was about a $10 million company. And then there were a bunch of like one or $2 million companies. And the $10 million company basically decided to sue everybody for patent infringement because they knew that every, all the smaller companies would buckle. And these were real companies. They weren't trolls or, I mean, technically not trolls or, or NPEs. They manufacture, all of them manufactured something. But the big company knew that if they sue everyone, they just give up. And they ended up buying up all the little companies because they couldn't afford to fight the patents until a company I worked for they realized that their insurance covered the patent uh, litigation. And so they said, okay, come on and sue us because it's our insurance company that's going to pay for it. And they got into a lawsuit and it turns out the big company went under because the little company had this insurance policy. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't know what the solution is. I honestly don't. But I, I think there's a lot of issues in business like this. People sue over all kinds of things. And I think it's part of it. I don't think it should be isolated by itself. It's part of a bigger issue with companies suing each other. And oh, the other thing I was going to say is I worked recently, about two years ago, for a company that in the press was called a patent troll. And it was really unfair because this was a company of really smart engineers who worked for a large semiconductor company. They invented a gaming device they left their employer, set up the company, patented it, manufactured it, got it on shelves, sold it online. But there was a giant company, and I think I can say it was Nintendo, who basically thought of the same thing around the same time. And Nintendo, of course, got all the shelf space at all the stores. And these guys couldn't get on the shelves because nobody wanted their little company to put the product on the shelves. And they continued selling it online, and they eventually sued Nintendo for patent infringement. And people called them a patent troll. And these were definitely not a patent troll. These were four guys who invented something great. They even had had negotiations with Nintendo. Now, I'm not saying Nintendo stole the idea, but they were trying to get Nintendo to buy the idea from them. And, and even through the litigation, they were still selling products online. So this is not a company that never produced anything. And these guys spent their life savings trying to get through the litigation. They eventually got a settlement. Uh, and then I think they went back to their previous employer because after the settlement, they had really burned up their, the money they got. I mean, they burned it up because of the litigation. Right. So the way that it works isn't always the way that we wish it would work. Right. So, so the other thing that happened to me year before I ever got involved in this kind of work, I developed some software that, uh, I sold to a medium sized company. It was actually the company I just mentioned, the small one that stayed in business because its insurance covered a patent case, a patent litigation against a bigger company, without naming names, although it's it's available on the web, I think, and in my book. <laughs> so, But this, this company grew to a nice size, and I used to do a lot of consulting work designing hardware and software for them. And I came up with this product, and I started selling a software product, and I started selling it to them, and they needed it for one key industry that they were selling their product to it. It wouldn't work without my software. And they were happy to buy my software. And then they were bought by a much bigger company who wasn't happy to buy my software. 
And so after a few years, they basically tried to buy my software from me and we couldn't reach a deal. So they said to me, we're going to make our own version. And friends had convinced me to patent this. I thought the software was not patentable. It seemed obvious. It was something I thought of in a weekend, but it took me months, if not a year to get this thing working. But I thought of, I said, well, I thought of this in one weekend. How difficult can that be? But again, it took me at least six months to actually implement it. And, uh, but friends convinced me to patent it, which I'm very glad I did because when the big company, when we couldn't reach a deal, they said, we're going to do it ourselves. And I said, but I've got a patent on it. And they said, we don't think your patent's any good. So they started, they dropped my product. My sales went to zero and they started selling their own product. And I'd been working with them for seven years. So they knew exactly how everything worked. So I went to a lawyer and I said, what do I do? He said, well, we could sue them, but it's going to cost you a hundred thousand dollar retainer fee just to get started. Plus, we're going to have to buy one of their machines to show that it infringes. And their machines cost a minimum of $1 million. So there's $1.1 million just to get started. So I obviously couldn't afford that. So what I did is I, I, I was thinking about what to do when a friend of mine recommended I sell my patents to an NPE, a quote-unquote patent troll. And I talked to them, and they bought my patents. And they had enough money to go after the big company, and I didn't. And so I didn't see them as a patent troll, but I saw them as a patent white knight. Here was a big company that basically knew I couldn't go after them. So they knew they could copy my software without any, uh, they thought they could do it without any damage. But when I sold my patents, I think things changed for them. That is really, really interesting. I, I should add too, when I first developed the software and I went to them, I'd been working with them on projects on and off for years and I had a really good relationship. And I said, hey, because they came to me and said, we need a solution. And I said, wow, that happens to be a solution I've been working on. And I gave them a demo in my house, in my bedroom. I set up a little network and I set up my software and I showed them how it would work. And they basically said, oh, we're working on the same thing and we should have ours done in a few months. And I I told them, I said, you could buy the rights to everything I've got right here really cheap because to me, it was like extra money on the side. And they didn't want to buy it because they were so certain they were going to have the same thing in a few months. And a year later, they called me and said they hadn't been able to get their version working. So they'd like to buy mine. And, and that's one thing I hadn't, that, that was what convinced me to patent it because I realized that in a year they hadn't gotten theirs working. And so it must be more valuable than I really thought. Let's take a break from this episode and really quickly talk about finding a job. You know, searching for a job can feel stressful, scary, and time consuming. Pushy recruiters try to sell you on roles you don't actually want, and the job boards make you feel like you're throwing your resume into a black hole never to be seen again. And sometimes you go all the way through an interview process just to find out that the very end that the salary offer or company culture doesn't match what you're looking for. Well, there's a solution. Hired.com is the world's most intelligent talent matching platform for full-time and contract opportunities. They make the job search faster, focused, and stress-free instead of endlessly applying to companies and hoping for the best. Hired puts you in control of how and when you connect with compelling opportunities. And after completing one simple application, top employers apply to you. And the best part is, is that you get money. That's right. They pay you if you get a job through them. Listeners to this show can earn double their normal hiring bonus by signing up with the show's link. That's right. You get $2,000 instead of $1,000. So go sign up at Hired.com slash JavaScript Jabber. I kind of want to change uh, directions a little bit. Um, I, I think I think the stories are really interesting and kind of illustrates to people, you know, maybe you should think about patenting or otherwise protecting your software. But I think a lot of places that people really worry about their code and intellectual property and things like that are in the cases where they're doing open source work. And mm-hmm. a lot of people use various licenses for different things. Um, but... How do you know whether or not something, because even open source, the, the code is copyrighted. So how do you know whether or not you can actually use something and what the restrictions are there? So that's a good point. In fact, some people don't realize that open source works only because of the copyright laws. Uh, so it is copyrighted and then anyone can decide to give it to, to give away any of the rights under whatever conditions they think are reasonable. But you know, there are companies that will examine code to make sure you've met all the requirements, but there's a lot of requirements and, you know, the GNU licenses, the DPLs get pretty complicated and there's different versions of them. There are companies that can guide you through that, 
what I can tell you is that I think things are changing a bit. But years ago, I know that every most major companies used open source code without following the license terms, partly because people didn't, you know, well, developers a lot of times would say, hey, I need this code. We'll worry about the license later. And they would just integrate it. And nobody ever talked to the lawyers or talked to the executives or were worried about it. And, and the other thing was, honestly, I think if people thought about it consciously, they said, if the open source community is making zero dollars off of this and they sue us, I don't, I don't know if this was a conscious process, but I know this was somewhere in the process. If the open source community sues us, what's their damages? It's zero because they weren't making money anyway. So, uh, okay, let them sue us and then they'll spend money on lawyers and then their damages will be zero. But a few years, a few years ago, that changed when somebody started putting up money for the lawsuits and then you can win statutory damages, which means there's a minimum amount of damages you can win without showing any that you've actually been damaged. And, uh, I forget who was sued. Busybox sued Cisco. I think it was Busybox and Cisco. Anyway, so I think companies have started cleaning up their code. But before that, everybody just copied and didn't worry about it. I, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people did. I don't know if that answers your question. It does a little bit. What, I, I guess the question is, is one, um, how do you decide which license you want to use on your software? And the other is, um, you know, how do you evaluate whether or not it's, so, it's software or a library you want to pull into your code now that you understand that if I'm using this without following the terms of the license, I could conceivably actually get sued. Yeah, I think from a realistic point of view, you probably won't get sued unless you're making a lot of money. Because even the open source community doesn't, and I'm not, I'm not saying that's permission to copy, but from a practical point of view, you might want to consider that. If you're doing it for a home project or a small company, it's, it's, you're probably not going to get sued. And again, I'm not saying it's okay to copy. It's just a practical issue. Uh, for the other question, I don't know. There is a company called Black Duck. Are you guys familiar with Black Duck? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. So, so, so let me backtrack a little bit. I've got a company that compares code. I mentioned that. And we're used in copyright litigation cases, software copyright litigation. So our tool called Code Suite is used to compare code and find out if it was copied with human intervention, but it, it allows you to make a, a, a detailed comparison. Black Duck has something similar, but to be perfectly honest, and, and I, this is not a, denigrating them in any way, their tool does not do as exhaustive a job as ours does, but it's not intended to. There's this development tool that as you're writing code, it can actually search the internet and find out if, you're, if you've just cut and pasted open source code. And if it does, it'll, it'll pop up a flag that'll tell you what the license requirements are. Or you can take a code base and have Black Duck go through it, and it will tell you what all the license requirements are and where the different code came from. And in that case, at that point, you go to a lawyer who, and these guys are very expensive if they're not in-house lawyers, but the lawyers who handle open source, when I talk to them, is there's they, they charge a lot, but they will go through and talk to you and make sure that you've met all the license requirements. But it's it's not an easy process. Did that kind of answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I guess the other question is, is, how do you determine if something was copied? Uh, I mean, you talked a little bit about the structure. I guess the, the, the part of it that I don't get is how can you tell which one's the original? Uh, yeah, I was, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was going to bring that up. So we don't actually, there's no quantitative way. You know, I've been trying to make everything quantitative. This, when you run code suite to compare code, you've got a correlation score of zero to a hundred and you can use that as a basis, but for determining who copied, it's more like real detective work. And in the training course that, that I give in the final exam, you've got to show who copied from whom. And there's clues that you get used to over the years, but it's never, it varies from case to case, but I can give you some examples. Uh, so in one case, we we're running on a really tight schedule, the initial comparison. And the law firm was in Washington, D.C. I'm out here in Silicon Valley. 
So a colleague of mine and I were finishing our comparison on the plane trip to Washington, D.C. to meet with the client and the law firm. And, uh, oh, no, go ahead. So, um, okay. So, uh, uh, as you know, and we were working for the, the, uh, defendant who said they hadn't copied any code. It was a big company and they were accused of copying code. So everything looked good. And our analysis, we're doing it on the plane and, and going over the results of the code suite comparison. And, uh, uh, you know, we thought we were in good shape. And, and I went to give the presentation at the law firm with the CEO of the company, the defendant there. And we put up the two programs side by side. And we said, we found that there's no copying. And I'll show you, here's an example of something we found. And, I'll, and it's very similar, but we can explain all the similarities. And I'll explain them to you one by one. And I stood there looking at it for a minute. And I said, ooh, here's something I didn't see. Now that I'm looking at it closely, I see, and you have a problem because you did copy code. And he said, how do you know that? And I said, well, you've got a whole bunch of lines of code that are pretty generic on bo in both programs when you look at them side by side. And our reasoning was, well, they're just generic lines of code. They were doing something very simple. I don't know what it was doing, but something that any programmer would do, and this is the most likely way they would do it. And then I noticed something in one program Every place there was a comment in one program, there was a blank line in the other program. Now, what are the chances that two people would write code independently and happen to put in arbitrary black lines in one program where there happened to be comments in the first program? What that told me is the program with the comments was the original program, and somebody had deleted all the comments, and that was the copied program. So in that case, there's no rule for that, so you just look at it, but nobody would leave blank lines there for no reason unless they were taking out comments. Right. That makes sense. So you see things like that. That, that part's kind of fun because it's, it's like solving a puzzle that nobody's solved before. And it gives you a really good feeling when you can do that kind of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. And in that case, you're, uh, you know, you're protecting something that somebody put out there. Right. And one issue that I've got is I know there are experts out there and consultants who will say whatever their client wants them to say. And I don't do that. And the people that work for me won't do that. I'm very strict about that. So I could have gone in and told the client that they were okay when they weren't. And, you know, I can give you some examples. I'll just give you one example uh, of the opposite extreme of some unethical behavior that goes on. But I once, I once had a case for a defendant who was no, a plaintiff who said that somebody had copied their code. They had a license agreement with a, with another company to use their code. And when the license agreement ran out, the other company appeared to still be using the, the code, even though they didn't have a license to it. And my client was a small company the plaintiff and the defendant was a really big company. And the lawyer said, well, examine the code and see if you can find whether they're still using it. Said, so just go to their website, download the code and see if you can determine whether they're still using our client's code. So I went to the website, downloaded an application and it consisted of a whole bunch of files. And one file was a bit for bit copy of my client's code. So I went to the attorney and I said, you don't need me to do anything. It, this is the exact code. Here it is being used. Uh, it's the binary. Uh, you know, you've got a slam dunk case. And he said, okay, thank you very much. And something like six months later, he called me up and he said, okay, they have, they filed a report that says they're not using the code. And I, and we have to rebut it. And I said, well, how could they say that? It's bit for bit compatible. It's bit for bit identical. And I read the expert's report. The defendant hired an expert who said it was coincident that these hundreds of thousands of bits happened to be the same. Huh. And unfortunately, that, that's the kind of thing we run up against once in a while. It seems like you can always pay someone money to tell you that you're right. Yeah, it's there's a lot of pressure on experts working on these kind of cases. There's a lot of money at stake. It could be anywhere from 
a million dollars to a you know in the Oracle goof case it was eight billion dollars. And you're under a lot of pressure to give the attorneys and the client the answer they want. And I think it takes uh, a lot of determination to not give them the answer they want. And it doesn't, you know, I'd say most lawyers that I've met are pretty ethical, are, are very ethical. Most of the ones I've met, there, there are exceptions to that. But even being ethical, they will put a lot of pressure on you to say what they want by saying, well, can't you see it this way? Is it possible you're wrong? Maybe you didn't explore, you know, explore this. And a lot of people give into that pressure and just say, yeah, you're right. And it, it's hard to resist. Yeah. One, one thing that you gave to us in the notes that we uh, got from you before the show was you mentioned that uh, Congress and the Supreme Court are changing patent laws. Uh, do you want to talk just briefly about that? We, we only have a few minutes before we have to start wrapping up the show, but I think it's an interesting exploration into, okay, so are patent laws getting better or worse, and why? So in my opinion, they're getting weaker, which I, some people are okay with. Uh, I'm not. But the best example I can give you is so Congress passed the America Invents Act, which reformed patent laws. Oh, previously somebody mentioned business method patents. Actually, with the America Invents Act, it made it virtually impossible to get a business method patent. And I'm, I'm not so sure that's a bad thing. I, I think business method patents are the kind of thing that nobody's convinced me they're a good idea. They're the kind of thing where you say, uh, hey, if I give you money and you give me 10% interest and give 5% to a charity and the other 5% goes into a, you know, goes to my friend. And then when my friend gets married, he gives me half of it back. You know, I'm just making something up. I'm going to patent that. And to me, that's not what patents were meant for. And so one possibly good thing about the American Vents Act is it's made those kind of business method patents where just people doing things is is virtually impossible to get anymore. But the worst thing that's happened in recent years is the Supreme Court, every few years, changes its mind on patents. And even if you think it's going in a good direction, it means that every few years the law changes, cases change. You could be in the middle of a litigation where you think you're going to win your case, whether you're defendant or plaintiff, and suddenly the Supreme Court passes a new law that changes everything, and you have to go reevaluate whether you're going to win your case. And I, I think that kind of – oh, go ahead. I've read the Constitution. I have an issue with the Supreme Court passing laws at all. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, and, and I should say technically they're interpreting laws. Um, I, I if I said – yeah. It's the same thing. Anyway. Yeah, it is. We'll skip it is. the politics and uh... – <laughs> Okay. Well, it, they've – one thing they've done, and I think patent attorneys across the board are pretty upset with this regardless of what you think. Uh, some patent attorneys are okay with it, but the majority of them are upset because there was a decision called Alice v. CLS Bank, or it's called the Alice decision. That was the name of a company. And the Supreme Court basically said software patents are legal, are enforceable. Software can be patented. There's no question that software can be patented. However, anything that consists of a series of steps uh, on a computer is not patentable. I, I'm not, I'm not saying it, you know, I'm paraphrasing, right? But basically everybody is scratching their head and saying, what did the Supreme court mean by that? It seems like they're saying software is patentable, but software is not patentable. And it's really thrown a monkey wrench. And we have actually federal court judges who are basically saying, I don't know what the Supreme court meant. So here's what I'm going to do. And they'll have to tell me if I did the right thing. Oh, man. Well, my programs aren't a series of steps. They're actually algorithms. Oh, in that case, you're in. You have no problem. <laughs> Sorry. I use heuristics. So, uh, Well, heuristics, I don't know. I think you can probably get a patent for that, too. I thought I was just using another name for algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we, we got to start wrapping up. Um, but this has been really great uh, conversation. Um, we're going to do what we call picks. And uh, they're basically just things that we like that make our lives better. Um, and you'll kind of get the gist because I'm going to make everybody else go first. Um, Amy, do you want to start us off with picks? 
Sure. Yep. I know I've been quiet today. Um, I have one pick. I think I saw this on Hacker News, but I thought it was pretty good. It goes along with something I picked a couple weeks ago, but it's, um, it's like cognitive bias cheat sheet. And uh, I don't know. It's just it's like something I've been interested in lately and trying to make sure that I don't do this. Uh, so it's a good like medium blog post. And then there's actually um, like a diagram at the end with all these different questions and things to consider. So I'll put a that or I'll put a link for that in the show notes.